So today's film, we always like to have one film in the festival that's shown on actual film, 35 millimeter film, okay? This isn't, it means it's not a digital print. These are actual reels of film like they were shown back in the day. As I said, we have a special short film that I'd like to show beforehand. And for both Q and A's, we're gonna do a brief Q and A with Jared first. So Jared Weiss is a storyboard artist, animator and designer currently living and working in Los Angeles. While he primarily works in television animation, Jared is also an accomplished independent filmmaker, having screened multiple shorts in festivals around the world. His film today is called Frog Dog Log, and did I say that right? I get that right? Yeah. So here's Olivia and Jared. Um, my question for you, though, first of all, was how was your time at SVA when you were here? Uh, good. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I had a lot of time to like, before I came to SVA, I hadn't animated at all. And so thankfully, within those four years, I learned how to animate. And I made a film a year back then. And I'm starting again to start um, make a film a year. So I'm glad I was able to get that practice in. Awesome. That sounds really cool. About Frog Dog Log, um, what, was, what is it based on? How did you get that inspiration for this? Um, the film actually started as a pitch back in 2015. Um, and Basically, the studio wanted to see a finished animatic because I was trying to just pitch something different to them at the time. Um, and it took me three years to, I, I finished the animatic, stopped working on it, made three other shorts, and I came back to it now. Awesome. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> but of course, animation is a lot of work. Yeah. Now, what, did you, what can we look forward to in the future from you? Because I know you just came back from LA, so what were you doing out there? Um, I just finished storyboarding on a new show for Adult Swim. It's called uh, Laser Wolf, and it'll probably come out sometime next year, and I storyboarded on all 10 episodes of that. So, and, and um, as I said, I'm trying to make a film a year, so I'm currently uh, working on my next one, which I partially wrote today. <laughs> Can you give us a little insight into what it might be? No. no. It's a total secret. <laughs> total secret. Total secret. Is there anything you find to be your favorite part of animating? Um, I mean, all my films I've made completely on my own. And so one of the coolest things is, you know, knowing I keep a lot of notes. So I'll, I have like a timeline, at least in my head and sometimes in scraps of paper of seeing that from an idea to a finished product and seeing that entire thing you know, along the way and being able to just, you know, process like, oh, this started from some weird idea I had while being in the woods and now it's a two minute short. Awesome. So you seem to like, do you do these animal creatures a lot because the main characters of this film are frog, dog, and a log. Mm -hmm. And do you find that you tend to gravitate towards animal-like creatures or do you like doing humanoid creatures as well? Um, generally, my work does not include people. Um, I like to sort of allow the characters to be a blank canvas for anybody, regardless of gender or identity or race. Regardless, you know, it's a blank canvas that anybody can just humanize and figure out what they want from that. Like Brazy is not a, anything, <laughs> um, and so that's kind of important to me to allow it to be as relatable as possible on an emotional level and not just a visual level. Awesome. Is there any sort of um, words of advice you have for current students, for anyone out there who loves to draw or animate or do anything that's artistic? Um, for like current students, I would say, you know, use the education you're getting, but also take the time to educate yourself on your own and, you know, just keep pushing yourself to learn from your own experiences. Um, and just try new techniques with each thing you do. Cool. You like using a lot of new techniques? Yeah. I, um, each of my shorts, I've always attempted to um, do a whole new production method each time. And so like this film is sort of a combination of things I learned from the last three films that I've made. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. I'm very excited to see this on the big screen. And I wish you the best of luck for what you're going on to. Thank you. And that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you.
Derek was born and raised in New Jersey and has always had a love for drawing and comic books. As a kid, he took classes at the Joe Kubert School, Kubert School of Cartooning before heading to SVA to become an illustrator. After graduation, Derek was recruited by Disney Feature Animation for their internship program. Following that, he was hired by Nickelodeon, where he worked on Rocco's Modern Life. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Arnold. <laughs> Cat Dog. <laughs> And Action League Now. Yes! It was on Rocco that Derek met Steven Hillenberg, and the two worked together to develop SpongeBob. Derek was the creative director for the first three seasons and co-wrote and co-produced the first feature-length movie. Following that, Derek worked as the exec producer for the first season of Adventure Time at Cartoon Network, and then at DreamWorks our Animation as a storyboard artist on Kung Fu Panda and Shrek 4, and as the head of story on Penguins of Madagascar. He is currently the animation director of marketing at Illumination Entertainment. Please welcome Derek Ryman. Hello. First, I want to say congratulations on the film. It was fantastic, right? Thank you. Yeah. So, congratulations on that. Um, so, you are a very big part of the original part of SpongeBob. You were doing, going from the theme song to storyboarding. You were just everywhere in the beginning of SpongeBob. What's it like to work in such a large franchise that like blew to such crazy proportions? Uh, well. You know, we, when we started, it was not obviously as big as, as it became. Uh, it didn't really blow up until we were about finished with the TV show. So uh, the, I mean, we, you know, we were making it uh, just, you know, for us to make ourselves laugh. And, and uh, you know, there was a lot of really funny, you know, people involved. Um, and then when we, f we were finished the show, I was actually on vacation here. We were, I think we had wrapped our last season and we were gearing up for the movie and I was um, down at the shore here and at uh, Seaside, I guess, where all the, all the rides are. And I remember walking out onto the, uh, onto the boardwalk and there was SpongeBob everywhere, like all the ride, all the, you know, toys and stuff, the, the giveaway stuff, I, that had never been. And it hit me, it's like, wow, it really, it really blew up, you know, and now we're done. <laughs> That sounds fantastic, just seeing it everywhere. I always love seeing SpongeBob everywhere, just to see it still going. Uh, you were, I looked up and found that some of the stories were based on things that you had as a child, like the Secret Box episode. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, a lot of the, uh, you know, there was, the story room was, I want to say four or five of us, maybe. Um, there was me and Steve, and there then there were three writers. And yeah, all the stories really came from, uh, mostly about, hey, this happened to me when I was a kid, or this happened, you know, little pieces and parts, and the secret box one, there's one where Sand they were planning a surprise party for Sandy, uh, coming from Texas. Uh, that was based on, I was, I had, uh, I was planning uh, a, a surprise party for my wife. At the time, she was my girlfriend, and, and she, she's very hard to trick, so my only way of doing it was I made her really angry <laughs> on the car ride over there, because I knew she would recognize all the cars from her friends and family. And so I said, oh, let's go to, she asked, what do you want to go for lunch? And she said, oh, let's go here. I'm like, ah, I don't, let's go to Burger King. And she's like, well, you know, I don't want to go to Burger King. I said, well, too bad. We're going to go to Burger King. It'll be fun. <laughs> she's, she's like, you know, it's my birthday, and I think I should be able to go where I want to go. And I said, well, just take it easy. You know, we're going to go where I want to go, and I know better. <laughs> so anyway, she was really furious with me. And we walk into, into Burger King, and then all her friends, you know, surprise. And, and so, uh, so we based that, that that scene in, uh, in, in that Sandy, the Texas one uh, on that. So very common uh, elements of our lives would, would become stories. Was there a part of the creation process that was possibly your favorite, just deep between like storyboarding and just coming up with the stories or even writing part of the theme song? Uh, it, you know, it was hard. It was really hard. It was, it was a hard job and, and uh, it, it it was fun on one hand because we would, you know, write jokes and make each other laugh. And then um, it was a l it, I can't say I, I did enjoy the whole process. I, I got from from writing all the way through uh, storyboarding into animatic into editorial. I, I enjoyed all of it. it. It's you know, and you, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are film majors. It's you know, it's not one piece or part of anything. You're you're making a film and you're not finished until it's until it's done. So. Even though it breaks down into parts, it, it's a it's the process of, of making a film. So so uh, I, I and you know when I was in school I was uh, I was an anim, uh, I was an illustration major so I didn't know anything about animation or film and I did I learned it 
you know, as, as my life went on. So I kind of learned it on the job. I learned it under Steve, you know, mostly. Um, and I really learned to, to love it as, a, as its own, you know, its own art form. So. What brought you to animation? You said you were an illustration major. Yeah, I was an illustration major. Uh, I grew up here on the East Coast, and I grew up in the late, it was late 80s when I got out of high school, and everyone told me uh, there are no jobs, and there is no way you're going to get a job. And, and uh, so that was just in my head all the time. And so I came to School of Visual Arts. It was the op first day. It was the orientation. And there was a guy up front, and he was you know, talking about all the things that the school offered. And one of them was, uh, and Disney comes, and they recruit, and, and uh, they pay you to come down for an internship. And that was the first job I had heard anybody say existed. So I, you know, that was my focus the whole, the whole four years, was to try to land that that internship, so, uh, and then I got it, got it, and, and, uh, and then when I was down in Florida, someone said, oh, you know, there's an animation industry in California where they, they'll pay you to draw storyboards, and, I, you know, I just kind of lucked in, you know, oh, I heard that, okay, then I went to LA and, 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 uh, and, and just kind of found my way into, I, I got out of school just as the, as Nickelodeon was starting, I think, Aladdin was released that year. This is way back, right? So Aladdin was released that year. Uh, TV animation was before Cartoon Network. It was before Nickelodeon. Really, was Nickelodeon. So it it really exploded just as I was showing up. And so I landed at Nickelodeon. They were they were hiring anybody that could hold a pencil, basically, and got in you know really early onto Rocco uh, as a as a cleanup artist and uh, and just and worked my way up. I was at uh, Nickelodeon for about 12 years, and that's, you know, and like I said, I met Steve at, 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 uh, at, at, Sp at Rocco, and he had gone to CalArts and was a film major and really understood animation, and so he had a really good sense of, of being a filmmaker. So I worked under him uh, once we got to SpongeBob, and I, that's where I really learned just about story and, and, and uh, you know, just the whole filmmaking process. And now you're at Illumination. Can you tell us what you're doing there or what you're working on now? Yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm at Illumination. They're the guys who do uh, Despicable Me and the Minions and, and that stuff. Um, and so I'm in the, they have a department that's uh, in their marketing department and we do all the shorts. So anything that's got, anything that's not the, the, the movie. So it's, it's commercials and it's uh, short, you know, little short bumpers. We, I'm working on a, uh, I'm working on a, a theme park ride and uh, uh, what else? The, the music videos we do. It's kind of oh, sorry. So it's, it's 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 anything that is you know in service of the movies. Some of them are commercials, which is you know not really what I come from. But then we do we get to do shorts and it's all storytelling at the end of the day and filmmaking. So it's very similar. Uh, you know, it's the same but just a little different. Is there possibly some? Of what is your possible favorite project that you have worked on so far? Since uh, at Illumination, you mean? Anywhere. Oh. From going from SpongeBob to Rocco to CatDog to Illumination, anywhere in between there. Uh, well, I, I think I have, I, I would say, you know, SpongeBob really was a highlight for me. I, uh, it was, I was really young. I was, I think I did the pilot when I was 27, and, you know, we did the, uh, you know the series while well, I was you know early 30s and I think we wrapped the movie when I was 35 so it was really a perfect time you know I was young I had hair it was you know really a perfect time in life uh, and you know it's, you know it was all we were all friends we were all people that worked on Rocco and so Steve you know hired you know people that fit into his you know sensibilities it's so it was a really I just felt like I was working with friends it was very much like college you know you, you have your friends you, you hang around you do stuff um, it was really that and it wasn't when SpongeBob ended and I went off into the real world and I started working at other studios I realized like oh yeah this is it's not always like this it's not always hanging out with your friends it's 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 most of the jobs are working for people you, you aren't friends with and so so SpongeBob really was a perfect time um, I had a really good time at Cartoon Network I was there for about a year and a half working on they had a shorts department, a shorts program. So we were just doing our own pilots and, uh, and nothing went anywhere, but it was just a lot of fun to make our own films. And then, and then the job I have now is, is very similar to SpongeBob. It's, it's really fun, it's a good, it's a good crew. I, I was able to hire a lot of people uh, that, that I was friends with. Uh, so they're, they're in the staff and I've met new people and it's, 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 uh, it reminds me of SpongeBob in that it's very 
uh, comedy driven and whatever's funny, whatever makes us all laugh is usually the thing that goes through. Have you been able to make things for yourself in the meantime while you're working? Like any sort of short films? Well, like I said, I, I started as, my dream was to be a comic book artist. So I, right early on, um, you know, I, was, I would always be drawing uh, my own stuff, but it was, you know, mostly superhero, dumb superhero stuff. So uh, my life now, my creative now is Instagram. I, I, I have an Instagram account and I just do my superhero stuff on that. But, but film, I don't do my own films. I don't ever, I really, I, it's funny, I don't really see myself uh, necessarily as an animator. I definitely don't see myself as an animator. Um, uh, if anything, I'm a story. You know, I'm a storyboard artist. If, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would. I would even th think to you know, like the the short we saw before was just was so great and fun and and cute and and it's that's the kind of stuff that Steve came out of. You know, he was a, a he was a uh, what do you call it? experimental animation major, and uh, he loved uh, and, and still loves. He loves uh, like all like. Bill Plimpton and like all the uh, you know kind of festival kind of people uh, and funny people, um, and I came from a completely different way. I love Batman and I you know I love the X Men and so it was it was an odd it was an odd com the two of us you know was an odd combo but um, it seemed to work. Awesome. Now, because you've been in the industry for so long, is there any sort of advice you'd give to all the animators out there or anyone who wants to go into film industry or even comics? Yeah, I would say I tell you know everybody who's young who's interested in doing animation, it's super competitive now. When I got, like I said, when I got out there, uh, you know, they would hire anybody that could draw. That was the kind of the thing, and and there were not a lot of animation studios. It's completely different now. Every every studio, every place has a has a great animation department, and, you, and these fantastic kids are coming out who draw way better than I could ever draw, and they're right out of school. So I really think the the thing to really focus on, I would say, is life drawing, anatomy, perspective. You know, you, you really have to have that stuff down cold so that once you get into film, it's about storytelling. And it's, it, the drawing is, it's like, it's like writing music. You have to really be able to, it's not about playing guitar, you have to be able to write a song. Does, does that make sense? So, uh, so I would say the first and foremost thing for anybody interested in getting into animation is really get your basics down. Anatomy, perspective, uh, and, and then, you know, develop your specialty. You know, there's certain elements you see in every movie. Uh, there's emotion, there's always moments where, you know, someone's up there crying, right, or they're trying to get you to cry. There's acting, which is, which is uh, you know, just beautiful, you know, telling, sto telling stories through, through, you know, physicality. There's third act, like action, camera going crazy, airplanes, you know, fighting in the sky and tanks, right? There's always that kind of moment. And then there's comedy. And it's those, you know, I, I would break it, like emotion and acting, I would say the same thing. So those three elements, I would say figure out what you love to do, what's really, uh, what do you feel strong about, and be really good at that thing. It's always good to be able to do a little bit of everything, but the guys, the people that work all the time are usually the experts. Like when we're staffing a movie, when they're staffing a movie, uh, that those are the elements. We need, we need some funny people, we need some people who are good emotions, and we need some people who are, who can really, move the camera and do the action stuff. And then you have filler. You have, oh, this guy's pretty good at everything, good at, good, good, you know, but they're the first to, they're the first to be gone. So if, 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 you're, if you're funny, be funny. You know, if, you're, if you like the emotional stuff, really go for that, or the acting, go for that. And if you love camera and, and, uh, and, and action scenes and fights and things like that, then focus on that. And, and that's probably a little, ahead. like you can kind of find that as you're working in the industry. But, but the drawing is the most important. You gotta be able to draw in order, they'll say, hey, we need a scene, bird's eye view, guy's holding a broom, someone else is jumping at him you know, off a shelf. And, and you have to go back and draw that you know, right away. And you can't be struggling with the eyeball and the, the hand and the perspective. And, Cause they'll, no, it's not quite right. Why don't we do it, you know, worm's eye view and get rid of the broom and give them, you know, give them a chair. And, and, and so you have to be able to draw that stuff really quick out of your head, so. I don't know, is that easy? Everybody knows that, right? I guess I'm saying stuff you already know. That's really great advice. So thank you. We're going to open it up to the audience now. There's going to be two mics running along the side, I believe. So if you could raise your hand if you have a question for... It's like Oprah. <laughs> if you have a question, we will pass um, microphones down yeah, I saw, and around. I saw that hand go up first. Thank you. 
And, and because his hand shot up so quickly, we have a special prize for him. <laughs> Sign Blu-ray. There, there you go. Pass that down. Don't steal it. <laughs> Thank you very, very, very much. I will always treasure this. <laughs> you don't need a microphone. I can hear you from here. <laughs> So Derek, um, all of us, of course, are huge diehard fans of the SpongeBob movie and, and all your works. So I'm curious, was there any specific, were there any specific moments, sequences, jokes in the SpongeBob movie that you wrote? You know, I was thinking about that before I came. Uh, the movie, there was, there were, I think, six of us that were storyboarding and writing on. It was uh, Steve, of course, Hillenberg, Paul Tibbet, Ken Osborne, Aaron Springer, and uh, Tim Hill which are probably names you guys all know if you're fans of the show. Um, and it's watching, I, haven't, I was telling, I think I was telling you out in the, in the lobby, I haven't seen this movie since we did it. Like, so it's close to 15 years. You know, I, I, we, I saw this movie every day for three years, and I really never wanted to see it again. And, and you sound like every other animator in the business. I guess so, yeah. I, I, my, my daughters always give me a hard time that when they were younger, I wouldn't let them watch it. Uh, they would they would pull it out on long trips. I would say turn it off. No, so they they never get anyway. Uh, the scenes I the thing, ones I remembered watching it because a lot of it was fresh. I you know my memory isn't that great, but the one that I do remember doing is the teardrop that goes into the into the thing that shorted out the light. I remember that was that was my idea, or or you know that was my solution to with the problem we were working on. Um, the the scene. Let's see. <laughs> I know it's so hard to. It's funny. Like I see pieces and parts of like the end scene where he's like given the big the speech, saying you know I'm just a kid or whatever. Just before the goofy goober, I had pieces of that. Um, some of the I used to get. They would give me. They would give me the uh, like those dramatic scenes of like everybody uh, get, getting the helmets put on their heads and it's turning scary when they're attacking Squidward. I mean those aren't really funny, but. Um, uh, so, so, so it's it's yeah, it's funny. It's pieces and parts, you know. And and again, I was on it from beginning to end. So so it's like, it, it, you, you know, it's so personal to see that stuff. The, I think I boarded out a lot of the opening of the pirates, the live action, like with the cards and <laughs> all that stuff. Um, anyway, is that? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was basically my question. I just wanted to know what did you work on. I'm thinking I'm thinking about that sequence where where we're playing this off. The bucket hats. If you're a comic book artist, I can, tell, I can, I can see somebody like you working on that kind of sequence because it's very filled with a lot of perspectives and yeah. like very dramatic um, shots. I think that's why I got stuck with that stuff. There's always crowds, too. And I remember it was like, oh, I got to these crowds. Great, oh, thank you very much. Here, we got a question down here. Uh, hi. 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 Uh, first, I just want to say thank you. Uh, second, um, you had talked before, and you know, I know everybody who writes comedy says, like, oh, the first thing you got to do is make yourself laugh and make your friend, you know, your teammates laugh. Uh, aside from that, what do you think makes a really good joke? Uh, you know, it's, it's a couple things. I think clarity is super important, right? You, you, you have to be clear with what you're saying and relatability. You know, the, you, have to, you have to write a joke. You have to write things that people can understand, you, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I, I think the, the, the SpongeBob, the moment where, you know, he's, uh, you know, just the premise of the movie. You know, he wants to be a manager of this, the the of the Krusty Krab tour, or assistant manager or something. It's such a dumb idea, right? Like, who cares about that? But somehow, that's the driving force of the movie. And I think the audience can relate to the idea that, you know, we've all been somewhere we wanted something really big that was important to us as 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 a kid. And you know, knowing it's not that big of a deal to the rest of the world, I think that's where people can. You know, feel the emotion, like when he walks away into the sunset, and uh, they, you know, you can you can grab him. So I, I would say always, uh, when you come up with stuff, you know, it's definitely good to test the crowd. You know, like we we had we had a group of, of people, and we would, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, we'd always show each other what we're working on, and of course, in, in, in the you know, we'd be in the room, and there'd be five or six of us in the room watching these animatics and watching the jokes play. If it doesn't play. You have to rewrite it. You have to be really critical, I would say. Super self-critical of what you're doing. Is it clear? It's funny, I was having lunch just today with um, Mark Osborne, who's the guy who directed the live-action por portion of, of the movies. Maybe you guys might. He's the guy director from uh, Kung Fu Panda, the first one. So you might, excuse me, you might know the name. And he was remembering a, a story with Steve where Steve, and I can't tell you what joke it was, but Steve was trying to get this joke 
in the movie, and he rewrote it, and he rewrote it, and he rewrote it, and it was always bombing, and it never played, never played, and he would just redo it, redo it. Finally, we're at the premiere, and and the movie's playing, and the joke played, and it bombed, and and uh, you know not bombed, it just didn't get a laugh, you know. And there's plenty of moments where I thought, oh, that's no, it didn't get a laugh. Uh, and at the end of the movie, he told Mark, he's like, ah, oh, the audience are stupid, they don't understand. So, <laughs> so uh, there are some jokes that you hang on to that you just you're not going to give up. But I would say for the most part, being self-critical. We have a question across there. Yes, I see um, a lot of things taken from um, other works, like the Odyssey, yeah. Wind, and um, the Little Mermaid when she did the spin. Yep, yep. And from the Bible, um, is that from your choice or? Well, is it, that again, it goes back to the question of, of relatability. You know, you know, there are there are there are, you know, they say there's seven stories, right? If you guys. Uh, it's all the books, right? There's seven stories, and every movie, every story you know comes out of one of these stories. So uh, you're going to see a lot of familiar things, you know. And 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 sure, there's, like there's there's Wizard of Oz. We would talk about Wizard of Oz a lot of times. We would talk about Saturday Night Fever. Like you just talk about all kinds of movies, good or bad, but they all have a certain structure. Um, and so you're going to see familiar things. So it's not necessarily uh, one of us. I have to get the Odyssey in there. You know, it's it's just kind of like, oh, we're doing a quest story. What are those? What are those archetypes? And that's an advi advice I would give to anybody if you're working on a story. Figure out what are your archetypes. Don't you don't you don't have to, you you can't reinvent the wheel. There's no point to it, right? You you you, you figure okay, I want to tell the hero's quest story, right? Which is what we did. So then we pulled, you know, well, there's this story and there's this story and this story and and what did they do? You know, how did they do it? And then you 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 know, what elements did they have? And uh, and you're trying to, you know, you know, copy those elements or do the same elements, but you do, you need those moments. Every, every one of the stories has the same moments, and so that, you know, you can go through that movie and probably analyze it and say, oh, well, this is that, and this is this, and this is the moment where the guy has doubt, and this is where, that that trench, you know, that scene, like that was, that's a that's a story point, super important, super common, where the character can't go forward because there's an obstacle, but he can't go backwards because home isn't the same as it was. That's a, that's a trope, right? And so we would just, okay, well, that's what we got to do. And then how do we make it unique? How do we make it interesting? How do we conquer it? How do we get them to go forward? So, uh, yeah, you definitely see uh, identifiable, you know, recognizable things. A question over here. Pass that. Thank you. Um, so obviously um, transitioning to in a cartoon that the average episode is only 11 minutes to a... 90-minute feature film that, by necessity, has to be grander in scope than the show it's based off of. That that has some difficulties. So, were there any moments where you were, where there are difficulties in figuring out how to transition from show to film, or? Yeah, that's a that's a good. That was that was Steve's big worry about making a movie, and and uh, he, that was. That was a big, big concern. So a couple things we did. First is uh, he hired Tim Hill, who uh, helped on the pilot, but he didn't work on the TV show because Tim had actually directed some movies and had some experience th that we didn't have. So, so Tim came in as our story editor. And then the second thing, uh, he bought a bunch of books, how to make a movie. And so <laughs> it was, I, th I mean, it might have been the very first day. We were in my office at Nickelodeon before we had moved to the, to the, to the offices where we made the movie. And, and he brings in this whole pile of how-to books and lays them on the table. And he says, all right, we've got to read all these books. And we, so we're going through them. and like, oh, we need that. Oh, there's another thing. Oh, I didn't know about this. And in walks this executive from uh, who had just greenlit the movie. And she, she walked in to kind of <laughs> wish us luck, and she sees us reading these how-to movies. And we're like, don't worry, lady, we're, we're going you know, to get it. <laughs> so yeah, so you're right. It, 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 it is a, it is a uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, because these were, SpongeBob's built to be in 11 minutes. So, uh, it, you know, 11 minutes, you start and you end in the same place, right? So you can start the next one in the same place. The characters don't change. Movies, the characters have huge arcs, right? And so. You watch Kung Fu Panda, he's a different character by the end, and that's what the audience expects. So we needed to end SpongeBob where we started, right? That he isn't different than the guy you know from the TV show, so we can keep doing those. Um, so, you know, I don't know, the TV shows into movies, they don't always work because they don't have that transition of a char character transition that, or transformation that, we're, that we want in a movie. But 
I don't know. It worked fine, I think. I mean, I liked it. So. We have a question down front. Hi, how's it going? Hey, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, were there any like um, episodes or scenes from the movie that were scrapped? Yeah, we did. Um, yeah, the, did you? You must have seen the second movie, right? The, yes. the SpongeBob second movie. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where the live-action pirate like stole something, and then I don't know if you remember this. They stole something, and uh, well, anyway, what happened was we originally had Patchy uh, in the movie, and he was telling the story. Uh, he, you know, the movie is opened up with him reading a book. And uh, Steve had this idea where at the end, uh, Patchy's the guy. You, you reveal at the end, Patchy's the one who actually stole the crown. And they find out. And so they chase him down. And he's running through the streets with the crown. And it's all live action. And there's like, I think Patchy's uh, peg leg turns into a jet. And he's flying around. <laughs> <laughs> so we boarded that all out. And it was funny. But, uh, it, you know, it didn't work into the movie. So they're definitely, I don't know, did, I don't you know, the DVD has a bunch of extra stuff. I don't know if we put that stuff in there or not. I can't remember. But yeah, that, so uh, it's funny when I watch it, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that idea. And that didn't, or like, well, I'm expecting to cut to something that, oh, it's not what, because it was in the movie for so long and it's not there. So, so anyway, yeah. What a loss. Yeah, yeah. Well, they put it in the second movie. Like the guy stole, he's the guy that wound up stealing the secret patty or something. And uh, so they, they, you know, Steve saved it. What do you think about like how um, everything's really dark and all the characters are flawed right now? Um, in this movie, in our movie? No, just like uh, the trend of like BoJack Horseman or Rick and Morty. Well, I think Rick and Morty and BoJack Horseman are are intended for a different audience, right? Yeah. You know, so you know that's not a six. You know, you're not gonna show a six year old, or maybe you will. I don't know. You, <laughs> uh, it's not really intended for that. So you know, SpongeBob was always intended for six to twelve. The fact that uh, adults liked it was, you know, definitely wasn't the plan. You know, we, you know, Steve especially just thought, oh, this is going to be just a weird, you know, quirky show, not thinking it would have appeal. You know, like you were asking, like, you don't, you can't plan for that. So, so. Uh, In the beginning sequence and throughout the film, I, I'm a writer, and so the transitions are what I notice because I have a hard time with those. And I was wondering, how did you guys come up with so many hilarious transitions between each moment. Like, SpongeBob wakes up and takes a shower and ends up in Squidward shower and <laughs> then, like, jumps and then, like, how, what's your process in figuring those moments out? Well, the, the, the way we do SpongeBob is, is, was different than, than, uh, than a lot of shows. You know, most shows are scripted. You know, writer would write them out and then the board artist would board them. And each sec, each section, or each process is pretty locked. You know, you write it and you lock it, and then you board it and you lock it, and then you make an, you know, then you time it and you lock it. And we, what we did on Rocco, and, and it really evolved on the SpongeBob, is that we would write outlines and they were loose, and then we would board it, and it would. Steve and I would work with the board artists, but you know, we we knew that we were going to make an animatic out of it. Which do you guys know what animatics are? Yeah, um, so we would we would we knew what we knew that once we get the animatic, we still have a lot of you know we still have time to adjust the dialogue, adjust the drawings, keep it, and then you for us once we got into once we're done with the animatic is when we locked it. So when we got to the movie, now it's like what four se five seasons later. So we, we were very loose uh, with the storyboarding at that point, and and we would put things into the animatic, and that's really where our the creative process, the really heavy duty creative creative process was. And what we would do is we would board it and we would get the story to work, but then we were always looking for jokes. The, th the thing that surprised me after not seeing it so long is it's, it's, a, it's just like a machine gun of jokes, right? It's just like joke, 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 joke. So, and, and that was really Steve. Like he was a, he was always looking for the fun. How do we make this funny? How do we find a joke? So once the story point was solved, uh, and, and usually it was a funny premise, uh, it was just like how do we just pepper joke on joke on joke? And, um, and, and so it's, that that's how you know it's just the organic nature of, of the process. It's funny watching this too. There's a couple of transitions. I'm like, oh, that needs a joke. That needs a joke. <laughs> so, uh, so you never. It's never perfect. Hi, uh, I'm I, hi. Uh, I'm an animator. I'm sure other people are in the room um, too. I just uh, I was wondering in terms of like submitting to studios. Do you have any advice of like do's or don'ts uh, in regards to like portfolios or? Well, you know, it's submit? it's funny. I've been out of I've been out of it, uh, out of that process for so long. It used to be that they would have drop off dates, and you would uh, you know drop off 
you know, once on a Wednesday and pick it up on a Monday or something. I don't know. Um, it, it's it's hard, you know. Like I said, the competition's super stiff. Um, everybody's just everybody's good, you know. So I would say, if you can, I would say get a, get a test and try to do a test. Um, and because what most shows are looking for is they're looking for people who draw in the style nowadays. It's not like oh you can do it and we'll teach you. It's they you really have to hit the ground running. So. Uh, if especially starting out, it, it's it would be helpful get get you know see if you can get people to give you tests, and then you can build a portfolio of tests. So you're you're applying to Cartoon Network, and you have a test from Nickelodeon. They don't know that you didn't work on it. You know they just they just see here's a test for Loud House or whatever you're working on, whatever you do, um, and they can get a sense of that you can actually storyboard that way, um, and and then hopefully kind of get in, you know get in that way. Um, does that help? Oh, so we usually, if you're looking looking for a storyboard job, let's say, um, they'll give you a page of script, and they'll have you do, you know, two two three minutes worth of storyboards, and and then and then they look at your they look at the work you did. You don't get paid for that. That's but it's it's a non paid test, um, which is you know it's a, it's not great, but that's how the world is. Um, so so that's, that's if you can get as more of those you can get, the better I would say. I know there. Are I know there are a ton of questions, but we only have time for two more. So someone has the mic over there already, and then Hi. we have one over Hello. here. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I love Neptune in the movie, but I also love Neptune in the show. Yeah. And I was just wondering what um, you know led to your your all decision to you know design a new Neptune and not just create a new character. How did that all come about? I think Neptune was you know. I mean, maybe we might have considered Poseidon or something, but Neptune just seems sillier. Um, uh, you know, I, we weren't, I remember we weren't oh, that thrilled with how Neptune worked out in the TV show. It didn't, it wasn't quite exa what we wanted. Um, we didn't do anything with it. We just did one episode, you know. So when we had the chance, I think we just said, eh, what the heck. Uh, let's, let's, you know, let's do something. We had, do you guys know Kaz? He was, he's the name you might know from the He, he wasn't working on the movie, but we, he did some design sketches and he drew him looking like a, like a uh, bowling ball pin, and uh, Steve's like, oh, that's funny. So, so it's very Fleischer. If you know, if you guys are fans of old animation, there's a very Fleischer feel to it, which was, you know, on purpose. And there's a scene in um, where they're getting drunk in the in the ice cream palace, and in the back you see a, a Harriman drawing, and you see a cigar uh, Popeye drawing, and so those are those are big influences on Steve, uh, his drawing style. Were those so a little little like uh, homage? Is that the right word? Um, thank you for coming. Um, this is going to be a, I've always been a big fan of SpongeBob, but this is going to be an interesting question to end on. But something I've always known, um, noticed throughout the franchise and the movies and the shows um, is like a queer undertone to um, SpongeBob and Patrick. Is that something that you had intentionally thought of? or um, No, I, you that know, that, qu that question came up during the movie. There was like, I think uh, the New York Times wrote an article uh, about Sponge and Patrick possibly being gay, and they took a quote that Steve gave and and uh, uh, you know put it in a way that I don't know. I think they were looking for some controversy. I think the thing is Sponge and Pat the characters they're they're prepubescent, right? They're, they're all their emotions, all their thoughts are. It's all about being friends. It's all about you know little boys hold hands, right? It, and so it 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 it's not. Uh, you know, Sa Sandy. You know, Sandy and SpongeBob. They're not. They're not having an affair, right? They're not. They're not. They're not. They're not having a, a, any kind of. I mean, there's no. It's a world where that doesn't exist. It's, it's a world where, you know, anything past puberty doesn't exist. It's all, even Mr. Krabs, right? Like it's all prepubescent. Uh, so, I, I think. But then on the other side, I think there's a message of like, there's an all-inclusive message to Sponge and Patrick, right? And and it's okay to to. To hold hands with your best friend, so um, I, I wouldn't say there's there's nothing sexual about it, but there's but there is an inclusion. That sound right? I think it's a great message to end on. Actually, let's give Derek and Olivia a big round of applause, as well as Jared. His shirt was great. Thank you so much for.